Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Covey Wellness Center podcast. I'm Sarah Covey, the host, and here with me today again for part two of our discussion on perfectionism are Tom and Karen, two wonderful therapists here at Covey Wellness Center. And so we just want to, as a reminder, before we jump into a jam-packed session today, we're excited about all the information and discussion that'll be super helpful for you. But we want to remind you that this is part two. So if you have not heard the first podcast, it might be helpful for you to just press pause here, backtrack and go to the first um, podcast on perfectionism, because it will give you some of the background. And we won't be recapping all of that today. We're going to do a quick high level flyby on some of those points. But then we're going to dive deeper into things we didn't cover. So um, please feel free to to pause and go back and listen to that first before you jump in with us here so that everything makes sense for you. So picking up the conversation today, Karen's going to take us through a bit of a recap, um, just to run through some of the the key points from last time to kind of set the stage for our conversation today. So Karen, talk to us about um, that need for perfectionism and how that defines um, what we're talking about here. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Uh, you know, when we think of perfectionism, we tend to think of somebody who's very, very diligent, conscientious, precise. And that's not really what we're talking about here under the banner of perfectionism. When we talk about perfectionism, it has inherently in it embedded this need to be perfect, this need to present as impeccable, without flaw, this need for achievement that exceeds the standard, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, called for typically. And so there's a lot of potholes in the road because of it. And although there are some researchers who will consider there's such a thing as healthy perfectionism, There's another camp of researchers that I will say I align with uh, who in their work have shown that it's not healthy. Mm -hmm. If it's perfectionism, it inherently has those potholes in it that bog you down with a lot of, you know, self-critical components to it or, um, uh, you know, this feeling of I'm not good enough. Mm. And, and so with it can come a lot of distress. Yes. So it's not just a preference, say, for things to be in order or, um, you know, something that just feels like that's that's really nice to have all of our numbers all lined up perfectly for our bookkeeping. It's not that it's more of that compulsion, that more instinctual level, that needs based, like I have to, I have to, not just I'm choosing to. Yeah. Right. It's difficult letting go. You know, mm-hmm. so we'll have students over striving. Um, mm. you know, workaholic where you're actually stealing time from another activity or from a family member you know right uh, you you have to stay present perseverating on whatever this task is because there's there's sort of an identity thing here where mm-hmm. oh like I'm 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 I am my work I am my score I am the outcome of this mm-hmm. and the stakes are so high yeah, it reminds me a little bit of, um, you know, Henry Nouwen talks about three lies that we often believe, uh, but where our identity comes from. And uh, one of those lies is, I am what I do. Another lie is, I am what I have. And another lie is, um, I am what others say about me. And we and there is a couple of other components to that theory that talk about being only as good as your worst day and um, always as bad, you know, as your best day. I'm not getting that perfectly right, but there's, there's some more to that. So for those of you who are familiar with Henry now, and just know that I'm focusing in on this, um, but there's that, you can see how any of those identity related things could lead to some form of perfectionism. It absolutely could feed that in. So, so, so interesting to think about it coming from that place of need um, as opposed to just preference, right? So um, 
Okay, what are the, so specifically in the research, we're going to do a little bit of a nerdy dive into that today, which I think will be helpful for people. So what are the three identified types of multidimensional trait perfectionism? What are we talking about here? Mm, well, I want to I want to start by first uh, mentioning a couple of key researchers, uh, Gordon Flett and Paul Hewitt, and also uh, Michelle Arpen Cribby. Uh, who was a professor of mine in uh, an advanced experimental psychology course hmm. on perfectionism. And uh, it, during that semester, I, I read over 60 studies in depth on perfectionism, wow. uh, trying to, you know, just decide what my stance would be on it because of the competing camps. Some, some saying that, oh, yes, this could be healthy. And also taking a look at the overlap, uh, you know, into burnout and suicidality and eating mm. disorders where perfectionism mm -hmm. is involved. And, mm -hmm. and I really landed in the camp of Hewitt and Flett and Arp and Cribby, uh, where I, I, I espouse seeing perfectionism as something that uh, is very freeing when we can start to identify it in ourselves and start to learn some key strategies of awareness mm -hmm. so that we can overcome. So I'll, I'll just mention the, the three uh, types briefly that mm -hmm. uh, have been revealed. And I, I think I'll kind of go at it maybe in the way that it might tend to unfold developmentally. Okay. So let's say that we're very, very young, you know, we're, we're, we're a baby, we're a toddler, and we're learning things from our environment. Mm -hmm. We're learning things by watching our parents and siblings who are older and, and going out from there, this circle of influences in our life. Mm -hmm. And so we're figuring out what's appropriate and what's not appropriate based on whether or not we're getting corrected for right, instance sure observing someone else being corrected and channeled into a certain behavior or thinking pattern and so if if i really take in what is being told to me from the outside from those influential places and this becomes extremely important to me we would say that that is socially prescribed perfectionism. Okay. If I feel the need to meet that standard of yours and hers and his and theirs, social media, for instance, you know, you just think mm -hmm. about magazines and the perfect model and the, mm. perfect, you know, anti-aging and all of these other things that, you know, this is what I need to be to be enough to measure up. Mm. I'm going to always be comparing myself against what's out there in my realm or family members, you know, prescribing mm. for me what I need to do to uh, be beyond reproach and therefore mm. feel, feel okay in my own skin. So, so that's, that's kind of an externalized local of control is really what you're saying. Locus yeah. of control. You're saying, okay, I'm taking the cues for what is going to keep me from making mistakes, being above reproach from something outside of myself, yeah, that's family, exactly. context, school, context, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly. Okay. Right. And that's the social oriented. Yeah. Socially prescribed. So, you know, out there. Is oh, sorry. Socially prescribed. prescribed. Yes. Um, that's, you know, that's the prescription that I'm following, you know, mm -hmm. for my life. So uh, it, you can see where that could lead into some pretty serious potholes a, a side um, note on that a, a, si yeah. a side note on that too is even thinking beyond just like seeing pictures in magazines or whatever is the the ubiquity like everywhere around us with filters and our cameras and tiktok and instagram and all that kind of stuff that yeah. it can be even more insidious that we don't even necessarily realize it that right. that comparison and that perfectionism coming out of the socialist the assumption that everything around us is perfect because the filters mm. allow it to be right. Like so this curated world. Yes. Right? Yeah. And it's, 
it's like, oh, I can never measure up to that. But that's what I'm aspiring to because that's what's being reflected back to me as yes. right. So socially yeah. prescribed would mm-hmm. be that external locus of control. Yeah. Okay. That's right. And so then imagine now that I've taken that in. And now, based on that standard that I'm perceiving, I maybe want to preemptively avoid any scorn from you, any correction or criticism or anything I perceive to be that by, I kind of think of uh, bringing the, I think of it as sort of bringing the prison warden inside. I'm going to bring the correction inside and make sure I hold myself to a really high standard. Right. So I'm going to So that you don't have to, Mm -hmm. I'll be ahead of you in that. I'm going to be ahead of you in that. Mm. And I am going to make sure that I not just uh, hand in a paper that's going to get me an A plus, I want it flawless, like not a single punctuation error. Nobody's asking for that, but the, I need that. And I need to know that that all these other pieces of my life are are meeting my standard far, far above and beyond. No grace for myself. Mm. Very punitive if I happen to fall short of my own mark. And you can see again how, wow, you know, whether this spans, let's say, you know, I I saw what, what I perceive through socially prescribed perfectionism to be the ideal figure but now I want to make sure that I even exceed that right so that I have a margin of error here I have a buffer and I can always feel good and presentable and you can see that it's it would be exhausting to keep up with all of the ways yes I could call so, myself to a highest standard it, it so it actually amplifies the pressure so the pressure was already externalized we take it internal and now we've upped the ante now not we perceived we had a socially prescribed idea of 80 percent, let's say that was required and now we take it inside and now it's 110 yeah, yeah right yeah. so yes that's and and so again we i can see and i can sense this in my own life, certainly how we can become our own worst enemy in that. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to, we're going to sacrifice our life Mm -hmm. for the cause of um, avoiding any perception of, of falling short of the mark Mm -hmm. with with anybody. I like your use of perception there too, because that's so important. We talk a lot about perception in therapy, but The perception may or may not be the reality, but it fuels the feelings, the behaviors, the interactions, right? How we're perceiving is the the paradigm that we're operating in, whether that's an accurate perception or not. It might not be an expectation, but we perceive that expectation. And so we ascribe to it, right? So let me, I'll give you an example. So, you know, let's say that In my developmental years, um, let's say that I grow up on a farm, for instance, and there's a lot of tasks and chores to be done. So from socially prescribed sources, I learn that I have to do this, 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 and I might get corrected on something I don't do well. So that's the socially prescribed. Now I'm going to bring that inside and I'm going to make sure that uh, in a self-oriented perfectionism that I'm, I'm really making sure to do everything perfectly and I'm going above and beyond. And now I'm going to even serve those people, perhaps parents, or, you know, I hear of aunts or uncles or grandparents, you know, who have these um, requirements, task requirements. So now I'm going to go above and beyond and make sure that I please them. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have a lot of people pleasing qualities and sacrifice Mm. my life and sacrifice often my kids, my family, all these um, sources close to me in service of people who uh, perhaps those people uh, are kind of in my past even, but Mm -hmm. I now have this pattern laid out of needing to do things for others. And I might be 
um, you can imagine there just aren't enough hours in the day. Yeah. Please everybody. But that pressure is just so huge. So that's self-oriented perfectionism. And, and it's uh, interesting that self-oriented is externalizes in people pleasing behaviors yes, because you'd think it would be directed you know you might I would think it might be directed inward which of course it is but the outward expression of that seems more about trying to live up to other people's standards yes yeah, so you right, can like, imagine if you really have higher measures of both of those types yeah you can see how, how enslaved you would be to people pleasing Yes. And to falling short of the mark. And so incredibly self-critical, mm -hmm. a lot of shame that mm -hmm. that is experienced. And it's very, very debilitating. So, mm. um, yeah, it just um, I, I really see a, a form of enslavement or imprisonment mm -hmm. when, when there's, you know, and you put yourself in the prison, really. Yeah. Right. And wow. So, then the third type is others oriented perfectionism. And just like it sounds, it's it's directed outward toward others. So with this particular type, and um I I'm now taking a look at what I believe you should be doing, and you, and you, and you, right, and you. And I've got my radar up for anything that you're doing that's not right, or mm. my virtue right. You know, this is what I think. This is how I think it should be done. And and you're not doing that well. Or I might even have really honorable intentions. Like I want to help you to not fall into a trap. So I'm going to just help you here and make sure that you mm -hmm. see the, the, the grammatical errors that you've made and all the other various things that, um, you know, it's one thing to see them. It's another thing to go out and point them out to somebody um unsolicited and mm -hmm. and there's a lot of that you know where here let me just help you to to you know fix this and, and not that. That, not that i'm saying we shouldn't you know have that kindness toward people and and you know mm -hmm. and sometimes offer a hand but there tends to be that lens and and also a criticalness of others can set in mm -hmm. that's very unforgiving and so um, you can see how this is really, this form is really disruptive to relationships. Oh, the, right. the word that jumped out was unsolicited. Mm. So it's like, it's like, you're not even asking for me to come in and evaluate or assess what's happening and give you the pointers. Yes. Um, and that it's one of those things where I think that could be um, with a healthy person, almost a superpower in a context where that makes sense. So I think about my background as an English teacher. Well, you are bringing your paper to me so that I can help you evaluate it and make it better and then hand in the next page. And so you're, you, the nature of that relationship and your submission of your draft for my feedback is actually, you want me to notice those things and help you improve, right? And mm -hmm. so, but I've been invited into yeah. that space and to say, here's how I can show you a pathway. I have some knowledge. I can help you. I know where to put that colon, right? Or that period. Yeah. And this is how you use your quotes. And, and so there's a, there's a value exchange in that. But the word is that invitation, right? Versus unsolicited. I'm going to jump into your life, whether you want me to or not, and teach you how to do it properly or correct you. And, right. and that feels like, really abrupt to a relationship and really distressing and and rupture um uh rupturing to the relationship because yeah. you're inserting yourself where you haven't been welcomed yes. you know and I, I also think it sets up it would set me up to become very um prideful you know to lose a sense of mm -hmm. humility where mm -hmm. you might hear things like well I wouldn't do that you know, if it were me, I'd be doing it this way. Yeah. And so, you know, you're doing it wrong, but I'm, I've, I've got a free pass, a get out of jail free card for the me. judgmentalism. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And so this, this constant evaluation of others and comparison, a lot of comparison. And so you can see how destructive uh, that would be. Now, I do want to say every human being 
has some measure of all three. Mm. It's dimensional. That's why we call it multidimensional. And so you're going to have these three types. Some people will have a little bit of one and greater measures of the others or, you know, it, and so there are, there are some uh, tools that we have to assess that. And, and then when you get that feedback, you're able to see, oh, wow, I didn't realize that I had, you know, that I it was really clinically speaking um, problematic. Right. Uh, and, and now I'm starting to see, okay. And we can, right we can receive some help in therapy then. Right. And so, yeah. um, because left unchecked, for instance, for, um, self-oriented, uh, types and, uh, socially prescribed, it can really land in burnout, pouring yourself out for yeah. others. If you have high, high measures of others oriented, it actually overlays um, narcissistic personality mm -hmm. disorder. If you start getting way, way, way up the scale, now I'm talking yeah. way up the scale. So sure. I'm not saying we're going around, you know, saying, oh, you must, you know, you must be a severe narcissist because, you know, you're pointing out something in other people. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that if there's that, in, if, if there's that entrenchment in evaluating others and being critical and having an edge in, mm -hmm. in the talk about others and backbiting and you know a lot of no uh, room for others even no, right like it's like this is just the yeah. singular way yeah. no mm -hmm. space for grace mm -hmm. and then at that point that's where we're going to stop and say okay let's just see where and how we can just gently and compassionately and lovingly um, bring an individual to a, a more sort of sober judgment of where they're at, where things are at, and introduce um, very uh, intentionally some authenticity, humility, mm -hmm. and passion. Mm -hmm. and, and that question we brought up last time too about what's it like to be on the other side of me, helping to mirror mm -hmm. that back. Because I think it goes back to this idea that perfectionists tend to be so hard on themselves that that projection outward doesn't always jive the same way in the sense that they're almost acclimatized in some cases to that inner critic that's relentless. And so then, then they don't understand why their correction of others isn't normal for them, you know? And of course it's, it's that sense of that this is um, like disruptive of healthy functioning, actually. But it's it's been normalized in a lot of people who struggle with perfectionism because it's the it's the replaying tape. It, it's like we we don't even realize how much that correction is coming at us. And mm -hmm. so you know when we when that judgmental uh, judgmentalism is directed outwards, we might not even realize that that's not received very well because we're so desensitized to it within ourselves. So that's bringing right. some awareness to that for people to say, actually this, this mirror of your others oriented correction <laughs> is actually telling you something about the gentleness you also need with yourself. Yes, absolutely. With yourself. And we see in the clinic, a lot of people coming in with, with um, some really significant issues with anxiety and rumination yeah. um, and, and low self-esteem, um, loss of identity. Um, yeah, you, you, re you can really lose yourself where you don't mm. even realize what do I want because I'm, I've, I've lost myself in the need to be beyond reproach. Right. And, and so at the core often of it is this, this need for approval from mm. others or from self. And a need sometimes to um, provide approval to others. Mm -hmm. And so it's not going to always look the same. So you don't have, you know, oh, there's a perfectionist. I can spot them. No, right. Not at all. 
And in fact, some people are surprisingly, um, you know, you'd be, you'd be surprised to, to know that if I, if I had a hoarding problem, that perfectionism would be at the root of that. Mm -hmm. If I had, um, you know, we, we tend to think of the perfectionist as everything all neatly and properly lined up, mm -hmm. but if I have high, high standards for myself and I fear appraisal, negative appraisal from others or myself, I am going to have a uh, decision hesitancy mm -hmm. and even decision paralysis. So yeah. this is how you land in that hoarding thing. Like I can't decide, will I need it again? What will I use it for? What will I, well, I'll just set it over here just in case. I can't make a mistake. So right. I can't That's move right. forward. That's okay, right. Tom, I want to bring you in because I can see we've been going back and forth and you've got lots of things. So let's jump in and hear from Tom. What are you thinking about so, after that intro? Well, what's what's funny is <clears throat> I was going to interrupt you in this moment to, to make a point that even as we're going through, I don't know how long we've been talking right now, but I haven't said a whole lot. Um, and just thinking about how, as we've been talking about this, thinking about how that is even a little bit of uh, an exemplification of my own perfectionism so far mm -hmm. in this podcast, in that just what you were saying there, Karen, about having that 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 paralysis or that that fear of, because for me, perfectionism isn't something that I've studied as much as you have, Karen. Um, I haven't hosted a podcast as much as you have, Sarah, or like been in this arena as much. And so for me, it feels more natural to, to think three times before I start to speak up on this topic. Mm. and and allow you guys to take that role and so I just it was just fascinating to me that this is such a perfect exemplification of how perfectionism can look very different than the demanding the, the verbal out loud demanding perfection from the people around me or from myself and sometimes in my life it can mean stepping back and not um not not holding uh not holding healthy boundaries in my life. Maybe that's a bit of a stretch for this, this context, but like even mm -hmm. holding boundaries and speaking up and saying something that might not be as well, well communicated as you might do it, Karen or, or Sarah. Um, but allowing myself to have these boundaries and say, oh, my point of view is, is worthwhile, even if it's not as articulate as yours right. in this space. Mm -hmm. So uh, for anyone watching, seeing so, me sitting here with my mouth closed, that's a perfect example of how that perfectionism can come out in less obvious ways as well. So what I'm hearing there, Tom, is like almost a self-censorship that's fueled by perfectionism, right? right? For sure. Like I'm just, I have to double trip, like almost a hypervigilance about, can I say this? And if I say it, will it be said the right way? And will it be understood by the people listing? Sure. And will they misconstrue that? Or will I- Or someone else can possibly say it better. Right. Or will I, will I sound like, I don't know what I'm talking about. Sure. Or if I, um, if I interrupt and talk over you, how does that sound on the podcast? Like all of right. those things are right. very real um, acting out of, of a perfectionist tendency mm. in, in this kind of context that on the surface might actually look like it's a good thing too. And that's an, another right. thing with these is that especially the self-oriented um, and the socially prescribed, it can be reframed unhealthily. Reframed is like, that's a quality. That's a quality that Tom um, sits there and allows other people to speak. Um, right. Sure, it, it can be a good quality in, in a counseling session when I'm allowing clients to share their story, but it also can be a minimizing of my own needs and of my value um, just right. for the sake of protecting that aura of, of perfection. Tom, Tom, thank you. That, the word, the word uh, boundaries just jumped out because really that's what we're talking about. It's violation of boundaries for all those types of perfectionism. Mm. In the oriented, you're going, you're violating the boundary by being uninvited. But, but when it's self-oriented, it, it, the boundary so thick that, you know, right. I'm holding myself back behind this wall. And so you can see it overlapping into um, social anxieties. Mm. Sure. Yeah. 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 And, and even and even in, in pride that like I am a conscientious person or yeah, that's another one of those things. Right. With perfectionism is conscientiousness. So like taking pride in being that uh, person mm -hmm. that lets other people go first or that doesn't 
um, and take those vulnerable steps to step into a potential mess. Because if we stay out of the mess, then we don't get dirty. Right. So it's an avoidant behavior is what we're talking yeah. about. Right. So, yeah. yeah. So that self-censorship is like, I, you know, I'm checking myself, but also I could be using this check mm -hmm. as a way to avoid engagement or to avoid mm -hmm. voicing something that might disrupt mm -hmm. or make the exchange between us imperfect. Right, right or disrupt my image or yeah. my people pleasing. So there's so much like at Karen, she's like, Oh yes, guys, you got it right off. <laughs> you know, yeah. but it's true. And and we want to be, you know, vulnerable. And there's a little bit of self-disclosure. And thank you for for taking the the step into that, Tom, because even in our last podcast on this topic, we all voiced and um admitted that we all struggle with perfectionism. That's why it's a topic we want to be talking about and sharing with because because we have this genuine empathy for the experience of those who have perfectionistic tendencies and who are struggling in different ways. And so we really do identify with that, not just professionally, but also personally. And so I appreciate you, you know, taking that risk to, to take the sensor off Tom and jump in yeah. and, and make that an example. Yolong would be very proud of us. Yolong <laughs> is a wonderful um, researcher and teacher in the psychological space that we talk about. He talks about using the here and now what's happening in this moment to inform. And, and Tom just did an amazing job of that right here and now in the podcast mm -hmm. too to help us. So, yeah. so that's so and, awesome. Yeah. Karen. And, and you used another great word there, Tom, too vulnerable, you know, mm -hmm. and so, uh, really being vulnerable is a very, very difficult thing when you believe that your worth is tied up in evaluation by others or by self. Mm -hmm. And so I, um, intentionally embracing being vulnerable is is a direction that can feel very very scary and yet mm. it is the gateway to authenticity and that authenticity ironically is what allows other people to feel more comfortable in our midst just as right. Sarah was saying with Tom like Tom has such a gift mm -hmm. for uh allowing others to just be and Tom that might be surprising for you to hear because I know you know you've said like do do I proceed do I not proceed and yet you choose time and again to be vulnerable and to just kind of gently put yourself your imperfect self out mm -hmm. there that I know for me, I feel very, very comfortable you know coming to you whether it's we're going to do a consultation, you know, together, or whatever, just to be able to, uh, to be open, and not have to put this mask up, this mask on. And, you know, I just want to share another uh, little thing on the on the level of vulnerability. I went from age nine, uh, age nine to age 27, with uh, daily panic attacks. There was just so much at stake for me because I had put up a mask and I had not realized it. I did not know, but I had erected a mask in my early years so that I would be acceptable, lovable, mm. approved of, but it wasn't who I was. And oh my gosh, you know, the damage that it caused to me and to others because uh eventually who you are is going to break through and this is how we wind up with a mismatch in our identity we kind of lose ourselves. i'm trying to be what other people want or need me to be as i perceive they need me to be mm -hmm. but it's not who i am who i am in my perception is not acceptable not lovable mm -hmm. and so you know to be in the midst of therapists who have unconditional positive regard for you, mm -hmm. who um, foster a space of compassion and, and really cultivate a garden of self-compassion with, within you is, mm -hmm. is just, there's, it's invaluable. You can't yeah. put a price on it. It's such a gift, right? Um, 
to be in the presence of people who allow you that authenticity and vulnerability and and non-censorship if you will you know yeah. and and what I when you were describing that Karen what I was thinking about is sometimes our instincts and this could be around any number of things not just perfectionism but sometimes our instinct um is to do something and it's precisely the opposite that's going to get the outcome we want and so um ignatius talks about like the agere contra in ignatian spirituality it's like the opposite action and we have this instinct that comes up in us for whatever reason personality nurture trauma um you know social conditioning whatever it is that tells us this is the way to do the thing and when you're talking about that like it's like we have to hold ourselves above reproach we have to present we have to mask we have to show up in a certain way in order to be liked respected valued and it's precisely when we remove our mask when we allow ourselves to be human with others when we admit our our imperfections and and show up as an actual shared human being that we yeah. get the need met that we actually want we think you know the lie that that our brain our stories that we tell ourselves are telling us is that this is the way to get that belonging to be approved of to be welcomed mm -hmm. to be um loved and yeah. then when we realize wait 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 if I just show up as myself, that's when I get true belonging. Like I think of Brene Brown's work around true belonging and all the pieces around, I mean, that's a whole episode on its own too, but you know, all the pieces around authentic belonging, it is in the tearing down of those masks and showing up with all of our idiosyncrasies and as we are imperfect, that creates the bond we're trying to have with the perfectionism. Is that making yeah. sense? Yes, totally. and, it brings, and it brings healing in the taking down of that mm -hmm. mouth. I've not had a panic attack since then. Right. Right. And so right. the healing that comes. Amen to that. Yeah. I don't have, mm -hmm. the stakes are not so high anymore. Now I'm not saying I don't struggle with, with perfectionism. I do. I will all the days of my life be working on this mm -hmm. at times, you know, get a rude awakening that where it's like oh gee I thought I was showing up again long in this than I am. <laughs> yes oh yeah and then we move to compassion for yeah. ourselves because that's the critic saying you should have had your perfectionism figured out by now <laughs> <Should've>. <laughs> which is ridiculous and, and in that place when we when we're able to develop that compassion for ourselves in those moments it also opens up the door to move into non-striving because mm. talking of that opposite action thing that you're referencing Sarah um to battle against perfectionism is one of the key things is to mm. lean into non-striving and 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 to create space where mess can happen and, and I say create intentionally as well because if we just it, it's a lot harder if we just allow it to happen because then it's as a strong with perfectionist out of our control that kind of thing that it's easier to yeah. move into those reactions those perfectionist reactions mm. but if we're intentional about creating space in our lives for mess for mistakes for imperfection it can build up that resilience within us and to build up that self-compassion and to build up that awareness where it doesn't have to be something that um perfectionist tendency doesn't have to be something that ingratiates itself in every aspect of our life when we're intentional about picking, whether it's, you know, I mean, just play with kids, right? Like mm. uh, you're, you're forced into mess when you're playing with kids, whether it's cooking, baking, or whether it's, I don't know, yeah. the opportunities are endless, but the point is to being intentional about choosing those spaces where we can practice non-striving, where we can practice right. embracing imperfection at, at low stakes too. That yeah. will make it easier for us to endure it in the high stakes moments. Well, it's like building muscles, right? So if we right. think about it from, you know, weightlifting or something like that, there's going to be resistance, right? But we're going to build up that resistance and build up muscles to be able to do things that we previously didn't. And so as we give ourselves these little opportunities to practice non-striving, to practice leaving the dishes undone until the next morning, that's a hard one for me <laughs> because 
Sometimes that's just the right decision, even though everything in you feels this need, the right decision might be to sit down and say that can wait, you know, or to ask for help or whatever it is that that instinct, can we, can we make space? And, and I'm thinking of like building the muscles for mistakes, like that, that we're welcoming them and not feeling like that activates us and says like, I can't actually live with mistakes mistakes are part of life. My mentor, when I first started down this road, because it feels like a tremendous responsibility. And I would assume that a lot of perfectionists would feel that they would have an over responsibility in a lot of things as well. Right. And so she said to me, the first thing I'm going to tell you, like literally the first thing she said to me is you will make mistakes. So let's start there. Right. And I thought, Oh, geez, I don't like that. But that was the right place to start because we're, we're imperfect humans doing all sorts of things in the world and mistakes are normal. And so building muscles to normalize that is so important. Um, Yeah. And I want to touch on one other thing there, which we haven't really explored a bit, which is a bit of a sidebar, but I think we'll all have some things to say about it is what's, what's the connection between control and perfectionism, you know, and and embracing imperfection and mistakes and things as like a stepping away from a need for control. Any thoughts on that? Because I I think that word, like there's people who are gonna go, wait, yeah, that's I have that need. How is there a connection? What do we think those connections are? Anybody wanna chime in on that? Yeah, I, you know what I I I really link that to that concept of need again. You know, when there's a need, it's it's a compulsive thing. If I can control all of the pieces, that was part of the mask that I had on. Mm. If I can just keep everything controlled, keep you controlled and me controlled and all these pieces controlled, think of everything and be completely reliable. And, and again, the pressure of it, this mm. striving that when you, you know, in mm. inheriting that word control, I think of the tension of it that is counter it's counterintuitive that the answer is less control you know as tom said non-striving and and sarah as you had suggested the paradox of it Mm -hmm. so although on the one hand we might conceive of it as building muscle for me i have a little bit of a different metaphor i actually see it as a letting go as a letting letting the rope just kind of hang with some slack mm-hmm. not trying to control it let mm-hmm. it just be allow other people to do certain things and to be able to experience the freedom mm-hmm. that's so foreign for per- for perfectionists and just yes. just step back mm-hmm. and let the chips fall where they may whoa mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a tough, that's a tough stance, right? So um, yeah, I, I I think freedom, like what, like just that resonance of that word, like what if I was free? Like there's so much in that non-striving, open-handed, mm-hmm. okay, I can release. Like I, we often talk about with my clients, like the way we often white knuckle through life, which is really a striving way through life. And if we can release that, like you're saying, let it, Fall, let the rope fall a little more loosely and not so taut all the time. Can how does that open us up to a freedom and really a, a life that's far more enjoyable, far healthier, far fun. F- fun? Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, I don't want to cut you off, Tom. If you have something to say mm-hmm. about that, uh, I think what comes up for me in in that thoughts about control and perfectionism is also coming back to authenticity Um, because oftentimes when we are fighting and battling for control there's some aspect of inauthenticity that's going on there because we're pushing our own boundaries and our own needs or other people's needs aside Mm -hmm. for the sake of trying to manage the outcome in a certain way and so it comes back to one of those aspects of really battling against perfectionism is being authentic with ourselves what are my needs right now? What are their needs right now? Um, and how can I accept and, and move in that authentic way and, and allow, create space for the mess? Yeah. You know, and the truth is we all live in a mess. 
you know, mess and messes are messy. So <laughs> there's a certain amount of, of acceptance, right. That we need to have that things are not perfect in life. And, and so how can we be in a mess without feeling like that's going to derail us like that we can be present. I know Karen, you shared last time just about your house and how I think it was your sister that was, um, I feel more comfortable in your house because it's lived in, you know, it's, it's uh welcome. It's gentler to be here. And that's sort of a, a picture of what that can feel like to just settle in to a space that doesn't, that isn't rigid, that isn't taught, that isn't white glove test perfect. Right. Um, and, and I, and I like that. I like that because it's that image, because it's hospitable, like a, like to be able to be with ourselves and with others in a place that allows for imperfection and authenticity is a hospitable place. Beautiful. Permission. Permission. Yeah. So we're coming to the end of our time today. I just want to um, give an opportunity before we wrap up. Are there any other thoughts that we didn't touch on that are just sort of coming up for either of you um, around any of the three types, the socially prescribed, self-oriented, others oriented, or any other things we're talking about around strategies um, or pathways maybe to attend to this perfectionism in ourselves any final thoughts or words or comments for our listeners today i think i would go ahead oh, i uh i would fall back to the end of our last uh podcast uh what we talked about to take away from that one was increasing awareness of mm -hmm. where perfectionism is mm -hmm. happening in our lives and having self-compassion around that and then into the next step with this one Re reiterating the need that in the midst of that awareness and self-compassion is to create those spaces where imperfection can happen and and to build on that to to allow to to have awareness in those moments and compassion and to um be proud of that opportunity to embrace imperfection and right. and see how that kind of starts to spill into the rest of our lives and the freedom that that brings mm-hmm those are key first steps. Yeah. You know how you're talking about it being more fun, Karen? I, I'm going to share this and it sounds hilarious, but I'm going to put it out there because it's coming to mind. Do you, I don't even know who the song is, but you know the song like, whoop, there it is. Whoop, there it is. I, as long as you were thinking about building awareness, I was thinking like, if we could just sing that song when we notice it, it's going to disentangle the intensity of that and have some, oh, there it is, right? Like, I don't, know, I don't know if that's crazy, but that's where my my brain is going. And I think part of it in that gentleness, again, with the inner critic, there's some strategies around naming the critic. And I've even heard strategies around singing out the criticisms that you're telling yourself to detach the intensity from them and make them show them for what they are right and so this song's coming to mind but that awareness to say oh there there it is and having a gentleness and a playfulness about that just to say oh i can i can step it i can name it to tame it as as we say sometimes in therapy and and just step step away as a start of that awareness and just say oh there's there's space for this there's grace for this right so i don't know <laughs> Yeah. We'll help people get there too. I, you know, a couple of key modalities that I use. One is solution focused brief therapy. Um, Tom utilizes that as well. And and we have a, podcasts on that earlier. So if that's of interest, pop back and listen to that series because it's fabulous as well. Yeah, that's strengths based, um, compassion filled um type of environment. And uh, I also do internal family systems work with people where we actually look with compassion on these aspects of ourselves that come up and through that compassionate stance these really uptight parts of ourselves relax back mm -hmm. and provide space for authenticity mm -hmm. and fun mm -hmm. absolutely and we'll all say i think it's fair to say you guys correct me if you're wrong but i'm pretty sure i'm right on this that uh it that we have all sought support in other counselors, professionals, friends, each other to help with perfectionism. It's not something that's easy to overcome 
on your own because we get stuck in our own patterning. I mean, that's true of a lot of issues, but but certainly that um, that connection with others is in that social support, that professional therapy support, um, you know, will move you through some of these things in a way that's so healthy. And so um, don't feel like you have to do this on your own. We we all haven't and continue to seek help from one another and, and our people um, to keep their perfectionism in check, to, to be mindful of how it's cropping up and influencing our freedom in our lives and our ability to be authentic. So um, please do reach out for help. That's what we are here for. Um, and you can do that just by going to CoveyWellnessCenter.com, our website, there's a contact us form. It's super simple. You can fill that out and send it in and that'll start the process of connecting you with somebody here. Um, but don't hesitate to do that. Therapy can be a really, obviously we're all for therapy here. It's why we do what we do, but we know the power of it as it relates to this, um, this topic that people struggle with. So please do reach out. Um, and also if you, uh, are listening and you know that you have other friends where these conversations have come up, maybe share the podcast with them and have a conversation um, with someone in your life about these things that you're dealing with, or maybe you're both dealing with and work it through together. We want this to be a resource that can be helpful to you and informative and, and start you on a path towards um, greater healing in this area of your life. So please do share. And, and if you um, would be so kind as to subscribe to our podcast and rate it, that'll help other people find it as well. And uh, we really do want this to be out in the world as something that serves others. Um, and so that's why we're having these conversations, not just as we do in our group room or whatever, behind closed doors because we all need them but in front of you so that you can you can share in that and we can offer what we have to you as well so i'm going to say thank you to tom and karen for joining us again today for another great conversation i always find a lot of value myself when we show up here together and i do hope it goes out into the world as a helpful tool so we'll we'll look forward to another podcast at some point in the future on another topic of choice but again back to the first part of this series if you haven't heard it already um because it is a two-parter that works together so make sure you listen to that and um we look forward to connecting with you again on another podcast with another guest thanks for tuning in today